Hey everyone, and welcome back. This is the Happy Cat here. And so for this entire month, we're gonna take a look at pathfinding as a mini series with weekly episodes. So this is my effort to kind of take a topic and mix my high level conceptual explanations with the implementation and technical details so we can go a little bit deeper into more specific topics while still keeping videos at a reasonable length. So we'll see how this goes. Anyway, let's get started. Pathfinding. What does that mean? In a nutshell, it's finding the shortest path between two points. Uh, this is often used for like an enemy chasing a player or a move to command like a right click uh, in a MOBA or top down game. But the principles of pathfinding are relevant across all of game programming and honestly tons of problems in computer science theory as a whole. So let's start with the most basic pathfinding problem to get an idea of what it is and how to actually go about solving it. All right, this is a little demo I did for this video, just a basic framework for us to test our solution to the shortest path problem. So this black cube is like our agent, our player, the thing we wanna move. And then the orange square is our goal state. That's where we're trying to get to. And we have these white nodes, which are walkable. And we can only move up, down, left, or right. No diagonal. So right now, for example, the cube can only move one to the right. And once it's here, it can choose to go up or to the right and so on. Uh, but the gray squares are obstacles. You could think of them as spikes or mountains. We just can't, we can't move on to one. We can't pass through one. So given this structure, we have to find the shortest path and then have the cube move there. So that's the final product. But before we talk about, I guess, how to actually find the shortest path, we first need to think about how we want to describe this environment. And there's tons of different ways you can do it. In fact, you could pause this video right now. I have a link to a GitHub with this project with a bunch of the functions blank so that you can try it out for yourself in this same framework. Um, the way I did it though, the way I thought about it is, okay, so let's regenerate another puzzle. And by the way, <laughs> the way I did it does not guarantee a solution. Like see, oh gosh, right here, there's a whole wall. It'll probably give me an error. Yeah, I didn't handle the errors and I did not ensure that there would always be a solution. There is a way to do that, but I didn't, I was lazy. Okay, another another bad one. Let's get a new puzzle. Okay, this one, this one looks fine. So how do we want to represent this in code with variables we can actually manipulate? Kind of think of an abstract representation. Well, first off, the player, we just need to know their current position. That's it, just one vector three. And then the goal state also, we just need to know its position. We don't need to know anything else about it. So we just need to store two positions for those. And then how do we want to describe our environment, our board? Well, we really, because this is such a simplified environment, uh, we really only need to know which nodes are walkable because these are all exactly one unit apart. So it's only ever gonna look one unit up, one unit down, one unit left, one unit right. So we can make a dictionary where we enter the node's position as a key and then it should spit out a value, true or false, of whether the node is walkable or not. So if we enter uh, the node one up from our current position into the dictionary, it should say true. So that's one. That's something we can use to understand our environment when we're thinking about our algorithm. So let's just take a look at the code really quickly. So this is the node network creator. It's just the basic thing that I used to make the network. As I said before, I just enter in a number of obstacles I want and it just randomly places them within the board range. Uh, but the only other thing besides what I mentioned earlier is that we have a dictionary of node references and you don't really need this for the algorithm. I just kept um, where you could enter the node's position and you get its game object and that was just for visualizing the path and setting the sprites. Uh, so really all you need is to populate walkable positions when you make your own node network if that's what you want. Uh, all of the rest of this is kind of like just instantiating the right graphics and stuff. But really all you need to solve the algorithm is this logic. So let's go to the agent. This is where kind of everything's happening. 
So we're going to be using a breadth first search. And this is just a traversal, visiting every single node in the graph. And then as soon as we reach our goal node, it has this interesting property where as soon as we reach the goal node, we'll have reference to each of its parents such that we will have the shortest path um, for an unweighted graph. Uh, so we could represent our game board before, our grid, as a graph of nodes and edges. And so that's what we're going to do now. I'm just making it this, this is just a completely random graph. So if like two white dots from our grid, our grid looked like this, if two white dots are next to each other, we can connect an edge to two nodes. This is just another way to represent it logically. Uh, but let's say there's an obstacle, we could say, okay, there's no edge connecting those. So we can go like this. I know I said no diagonals, but don't think of this as the grid. Just think of this as a general representation. You could use graphs. Uh, you could just, instead of node positions, you could just call it node A, node B. You could call it Los Angeles and San Francisco, finding shortest path between two cities. This applies to a lot of stuff. So that's why I actually think graph theory and learning pathing is a really good skill to have. So a breadth first search. Let's walk through what it looks like so that you get the feel for it and we'll go from there and actually explain what some of this code means. Uh, so the code for breadth first search is in the back and you can follow along with that if you want. But okay, here's our starting position. And let's say this is our goal right here. This is the spot that we want to get to. I'll make sure to write it. This is our goal. Breadth first search. So we start here. We only have one node to look at from our starting position. So we'll mark this as one. So we visited this node. We've explored that. We never need to come back to it. And same here, we have exactly one connection. So we're gonna go here to two. Now we have two connections, right? So we're gonna add these to our nodes to explore. And you'll notice over here, we have this queue. So a queue data structure is basically what you'd expect, like you're waiting in line. If you have a bunch of people lined up, the first person that was in line is the first person that gets to go out. And if you want to add something, it goes to the end of the line. So that's what we're using for breadth first search. We're basically saying, okay, we looked at one, now we don't need to look at it. We looked at two, now we don't need to look at it. But now we're putting three and four to our queue. So we're gonna look at three first, because that's the first one in line. And so three has one connection, so we're gonna put five over there. But now five's at the end of the line. We've looked at three, but we have to look at four before we can get to five. As it happens, there's nothing to look at from four, so we can cross that off. And now we're just looking at five. Okay, so we're gonna keep going like this till we get to our goal, which we're almost there. So we add six and seven to the line. Five is good. We're gonna look at six and add eight to the end of the line. And now we're gonna look at seven. And as it happens, seven is connected to our goal. So we can cross off seven and now we actually have the shortest path. So throughout this, we're keeping a reference to their parents. You can see this right here. Uh, we're adding uh, a reference to the parent every time we explore a node. And the parent is just the previous node, like how do we get to this current node? So for example, from the goal, uh, we were at seven, and then we got to seven from five, five from three, three from two, and so on. So now we actually have, let me highlight it, we have our shortest path, even though we explored a bunch of other nodes. Uh, but then just to give you some contrast, we have a depth first search. So depth first search is the exact same thing, but it uses a structure called a stack. So the only difference, literally all of this code is exactly the same. The only difference is that we're gonna use a stack right there. And a stack is sort of the opposite of a queue. I like to think of a stack as actually just a stack of books. Just think of a stack of books in real life. So here's a table right here. And so the first book we had to put down in the stack is the one at the bottom. Then we put this one, then this one, then this one. 
but the one at the top is the only one available to us without them all toppling. So we have to take the one on top. So instead of being the first in, first out, like the queue, the first one that goes in is the last one that goes out. So you can have the exact same um, traversal code, just switch it out to a stack, and you will traverse the entire graph at the end, but you might not get the shortest path. So we're still gonna start here, and then we go to node number one. Now let's draw out our stack so that we can see. So we put our first book, I guess, on the table and we're gonna add its only connection, node number two. So we've explored one, so we can take that off. And we're gonna add node number two. And then node number two is going to look at three and four. So now we have two connections. We have three, we have four. And so we're actually going to look at four first because that's the top of our stack. So we're gonna look at four and we see that we already have three in there. So we're not gonna add that again. So we're gonna look at three now. And three has five. So we're gonna just move through this. We have six and seven. So we have six, seven, cross this off. So this is where we're taking seven first, right? So this is where if, depending on the order that we're looking, if we looked at this one first, we would find the goal and we'd have pretty much the same shortest path as the breadth first search. But this is where it doesn't guarantee it. You can get kind of lucky, maybe not, um, because now we're gonna look at seven, right? And then seven's just gonna take us all the way here. We're going eight, nine. We're gonna go as far as we can get to until we're at a stopping point. So if this was a dead end, we'd stop here, we'd return the shortest path, but it's not. So we're gonna get to the goal and say, oh my God, we found the goal. Now we're gonna go this way and we're gonna return this as our shortest path, this thing. And a breadth first search does have the guarantee that that won't happen uh, because we went like that. <laughs> Now that you have a visual idea of what's going on, the code should be pretty reasonable to follow. So first we're just getting into our start state. So we have a set of the nodes we've already explored. So we're gonna put things that we've already been to in here to make sure that we don't add them to the queue again, cause then we'd go in circles. And then we're just gonna add our start position to the queue. So let's actually put this up here. So we're at one, this is our queue going in line and then while we have stuff in the queue so we have one thing in the queue we're going to day queue it which means we're going to take it off and if that happens to be the goal great return the goal position otherwise we're going to look in our case we're going to look up down right left and if there's like a barrier here like we've reached the bounds then we're not going to return this uh, if there's an obstacle here, then we're not going to return that. So let's say we just have up and down. So we're going to just return those positions um, based on this function. Then for each node that we've returned, so in this case we just have two. Uh, so for each of these, we're going to first see, does this contain this node? And let's say this position is like one, zero, one. So does this set have that node? It does not. So now we're going to add this to our explored node set. We're gonna add this vector and we can have all sorts of others. We can have like nine, zero, three, stuff like that. We'll have a bunch of these. And then we're gonna make sure that we keep a reference to its parent. So in this case, the parent is one. Um, this is just my abstract representation, but really we're using the vector positions as keys in this case. But for now, let's, say, okay, so one, we're gonna say if we enter two as a key, it'll return its parent node, if that makes sense. So in this case, two is one, zero, one, uh, and this might be one, zero, zero. And then we're gonna on queue two, right? So let's say this one's two, this one's three. We're gonna do the same for three. We're going to add it to the explored node somewhere in here. We're going to 
keep a reference to its parent. So now we have, uh, if we enter three into our dictionary, we'll get one as the parent. And now we're also gonna on cue three. So now we're gonna look at two and so on, because while we have things in the queue, we have two and three in the queue. We're gonna keep going till we reach our goal state. And then we know that if a the start position was returned, that we didn't find a solution. And in this case, my code doesn't really handle that error. It just says null and freaks out at you. Uh, but if it does return the goal position, what we can do is then we can go here and say, okay, starting from the goal, keep looking up the node parents and saving that to a path. So now we have a saved representation of every single node going up to the goal node, and that's our shortest path. And then finally, we can just visualize this by iterating through that list that we made of the path, and then just, in this case, changing the sprites to represent, to represent it. So now that we kind of know BFS and DFS, I think you can kind of appreciate, let's see, this one will have a solution. So in breadth first search, we found the shortest path here, but now let's look at the depth first search. So you can see how it's pretty much, I think, I think the order that I do is, it's like, I think it's up, down, left, right. That's the thing where the order that we do, that we examine the different nodes can matter. Because you can see it's trying to go up as much as possible. And only when it hits an obstacle does it actually decide to move to the right. But then eventually it finds the goal. Um, so if I said, if I just made it uh, examine the node to the right first, it's possible that it could maybe find a shorter path than it did. So this has been my first video in a mini series on pathfinding, just the basics of breadth first search and depth first search and getting our framework set up. Uh, in the next video, we will take a look at Dijkstra's algorithm along with A star and different heuristics we can use for A star. So definitely stay tuned. And most importantly, have a happy day wherever you are. I'll see you guys soon. Bye.